So we covered the benzodiazepines. Let's talk a little bit about a couple of herbal products. Kava. Kava is uh, an extract from a plant. It's the Piper methysticum plant, and it's a member of the black pepper family. It goes by some other names. You'll hear it as kava kava, kava root, kava pepper. It is um, interesting. It's been used for thousands of years during uh, Pacific cultures, rituals, social gatherings, medicinal things. Um, but what we use in this particular plant is the root and the rhizome. That The rhizome is that underground horizontal stem. So the active ingredient or the active component is called cavalactone. And the cavalactone is thought to help decrease anxiety and relax the muscles. It may be in a mechanism that's very similar to the benzodiazepines, but we're not really 100% certain. Because remember, this is an herbal product, so it doesn't have the same kind of research behind it. Now, we may know of kava, kava as a pill, but you can also buy it in a tea and different forms. Um, and although it's used to relieve the anxiety, the stress, and restlessness, and promote sleep. It can cause a temporary yellowing of the skin. Now that's with extended continued intake. And so uh, what they'll see is that it has this uh, characteristic scaly kind of cracked skin change that is reversible when the kava is discontinued. Also the same thing occurs with the visual disturbances can occur. They are temporary and once that Medic that kava is stopped, then they reverse. There are potential interactions with alcohol, barbiturates, any of the psychoactive drugs, including the benzodiazepines. It is contraindicated in liver disease, alcoholism, and other conditions. Now, in some countries, kava has been banned because it has, uh, there has been cause of liver, it found as to be the cause of liver disease, excuse me, got stumbled there. And um, it's unclear as to whether that is because of the processing. It was um, processed sometimes with acetone and not water or alcohol, ethanol and not water. And so that causes the liver disease. We're not really sure, but just be aware that it's contraindicated in current liver disease. As with any of these medications, not just the kava, the, all of the CNS depressants, patients should not be operating heavy machinery during use. And incidentally, your car is a heavy piece of equipment. So we need to be sure that patients are aware that just because it's over the counter doesn't mean that they should not take the same precautions that they would use with any other CNS depressant. Let's talk for a minute about valerian. Now valerian is used to relieve anxiety, restlessness, and sleep disorders. It is from the, uh, it's a, fam a plant, it's a perennial plant, the valerianacea family of plants. One of the things to note about valerian is that it has a very distinctive odor. I personally find it a very unpleasant odor. It's a very bitter herb. So some people don't like it. They don't like its odor or they don't like that, um, that bitter taste. Interesting little factoid. During World War II, it was used in England to relieve the stress of air raids. You can find that information in a book by Grieve called, uh, in, uh, called A Modern Herbal. It was printed in 1974 in New York by Hafner Press. So it's believed that the mechanism of action by which valerian works is that it increases the amount of GABA available in the synaptic cleft. Um, so as a result, it can cause CNS depression, hepatotoxicity, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, can cause restlessness, uh, insomnia, and it has many interactions, including other CNS depressants, your monom uh, 
monamine oxidase inhibitors. Those are a very potent class of antidepressants. Phenytoin, that's, called, that's you may know as dilantin, warfarin, which is Coumadin, and alcohol. Um, it is contraindicated in cardiac and liver disease. And the reason it's contraindicated in cardiac disease is that at one time, there was discussion of classifying it as a stimulant because it does have the potential to cause heart palpitations. So we don't want to give it to someone who has cardiac disease. Uh, patients, again, should not operate heavy machinery during its use. And can, depending on the dose that the patient takes or uh, how often they take it, they can also have the effect of having the morning after, they will have a decreased reaction time, a decrease in their alertness, and the decrease in concentration. So this is something that the patient needs to be aware of. It can have that lingering effect. Um, women who are pregnant or nursing shouldn't take valerian because of the risk of a fetus and infant haven't been evaluated. Children than, that are younger than three years old should not take valerian. Um, and individuals who take valerian should be aware of the additive effects if they take it with any other, any other medication or any other CNS depressant. We also want to educate the patients not to take valerian with St. John's wort or kava or melatonin because of the additive effect that can occur. So let's talk about the barbiturates. These were first introduced in 1903, and they were the standard drugs for insomnia and sedations for a long time. The problem is, is that they are very habit-forming, and they have a low therapeutic index. There's only a handful of commonly barbiturates that are used today, partially because of the safety and eff efficacy of the benzodiazepines is so much better. Uh, the barbiturates are classified into four different categories based on their onset and duration of action. Table 12.5 in your textbooks lists the barbiturates in each of these categories, so you might want to use that to aid you in your studies. What's their mechanism of action? How do the barbiturates work? Well, their site of action is the reticular formation of the brainstem. So what is that? Well, in the brainstem, there's this reticular formation, and it's a network of these diffuse aggregation of neurons. They're distributed throughout the central parts of the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. This also fills the spaces between the cranial nerve nuclei and the olivary bodies, and it intermixes both with ascending and descending tracts of the, uh, the nerve fibers. Mm -hmm. And what does it actually do? Well, this... Um, reticular formation is also, you may remember it as the reticular activating system. So it keeps us in these various levels of alertness. It's responsible for our sleep-wake cycle. And um, it works, the barbiturates work on this by potentiating the action of GABA and the nerve impulses that are traveling in the cerebral cortex traveling through here and it inhibits them. So one of the good things about barbiturates is that they can actually raise the seizure threshold. So by raising the seizure threshold, we can sometimes use these in the treatments of seizures. Now we don't use them as much as we did in the past because of their side effect profile. Our new, uh, our, our newer Anti-epileptics offer us more favorable side effect profiles than the barbiturates do, but you will sometimes still see them used for that. So what are the drug effects of the barbiturates? Well, in low doses, they have sedative effects, and in high doses, they have hypnotic effects. They also lower the respiratory rate. They are notorious enzyme inducers, so they stimulate liver enzymes that cause metabolism or the breakdown of many other drugs which can result in shortened duration of actions, both for the barbiturates and these drugs. Um, their indications are as a sedative. We will use them less often now for sedative effects, simply because we have such a better side effect profile with our benzodiazepines or with our sedative hypnotics. 
Um, anticonvulsants, we may use it in epilepsy. We will also use it in certain types of convulsions. For example, if we have severe trauma to the skull or there's increased intracranial pressure in the skull, um, it can be used as anesthetic for general or surgical procedures. And some of the off-label uses for barbiturates include use of migraines, although that's actually usually only when we send them to a specialist and they've tried all of the other types of migraine medications. Um, we can see it sometimes used in trauma, as I said, if we have increased intracranial pressure. The barbiturates are divided into four categories. The ultra short acting, we'll use this for anesthesia or short surgical procedure or other short term uses. We'll use the short acting for sedation and control of convulsive conditions when we don't have perhaps a benzodiazepine available. We may use the interactive or intermediate acting for sedation and control of convulsive additions. Um, the long acting, we really do not use them for sleep induction anymore. So we need to probably put that out of our mind, but we do use them some in uh, epileptic seizure, seizure prophylaxis. And we'll touch on the barbiturates again when we get to talking about the anti-epileptics. Uh, uh, I just wanna stress, we really don't use them for sleep induction because of the risk for addiction. And unfortunately, because of this, they can they will sometimes be used as a recreational drug because they produce effects very similar to alcohol, uh, relaxation, euphoria, slurred speech, loss of coordination, impaired judgment, and confusion. Uh, adverse effects by body system, cardiovascularly, you'll see vasodilation and hypotension. The CNS again are drowsiness, lethargy, and vertigo. Respiratory, we'll see respiratory depression and a cough. Our GI, you'll have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. Hematologically, you may see a granulocytosis or a thrombocytopenia. And then other side effects or adverse effects that you may see are hypersensitivity reaction and what we call Steven Johnson syndrome. They do reduce REM sleep, resulting in agitation and lower our ability to deal with normal stressors. So you can tell by this risk, uh, the risk of these adverse effects, that the barbiturates are not preferred for use in elderly. In toxicity and overdose, we, seek, we will see respiratory depression and subsequent respiratory arrest. So the overdose produces the CNS depression where they go to sleep and then they go to coma and then death. Um, we can use um, barbiturates, remember, for therapeutic reasons. Like if we have uncontrollable seizures and we need or anesthesia induction. So sometimes you'll hear of a patient being placed into a phenobarb coma or a phenobarbital coma. That's when we have status epilepticus and we can't get it controlled. During this phenobarbital coma, they're going to be placed on a ventilator and while we figure out what's going on. For treatment of a barbiturate overdose, we will use symptomatic and supportive care. We want to maintain an adequate airway. Often they'll be a ventilator dependent and getting oxygen therapy. We're going to give them fluids, perhaps depending on the length of time, maybe some TPN or some of the other electrolyte fluids, uh, maybe some vasopressors, and if we catch it early enough, activated charcoal. Drug interactions include additive effects from alcohol, antihistamines, benzodiazepines, opioids, and tranquilizers. Uh, it inhibits the metabolism and so our MAOIs will prolong the effects of barbiturates and things that increase the metabolism will then reduce. So this can reduce the anticoagulant response leading to possible clot formation. Our common ones are phenobarbital and pentobarbital. Pentobarbital or nembital will be used in our anesthesia, whereas phenobarbital will be more often used for controlling seizures. So we're going to go to a third one now for muscle relaxants. See you around the corner.